Thank you for being here. This is a new uh, event and a round table from COMPETE, uh, the research group on competition, public policy, innovation, technology at FGV. We have the pleasure to have with us Professor Kirsten uh, from the University of Dusseldorf, uh, where he teaches uh, civil law, corporate law, and competition law. So it's a very broad uh, uh, spectrum of uh, um, research and teaching. And we're here today uh, discussing immunity for cartelists and a new proposal for uh, the European system. Of course, this has impact um, for all of us in all jurisdictions that have some leniency programs. So I think that's particularly uh, uh, important for our debate. And as we listen about Europe, I think we should reflect as well uh, on issues that we can tweak in our own leniency programs to make them more effective and more attractive uh, to leniency applicants uh, these days. Before we start, let me just uh, read a disclaimer here. So the manifestations expressed by members of the staff of Getulio Vargas Foundation and by guests who participate in the events and control them online represent exclusively the opinions of the authors and not necessarily the institutional position of FGV. We all reiterate that everyone present here agreed to participate in this event spontaneously and with that, authorize the use of their name, voice, and image, in addition to assigning the copyrights related to their exposure for this transmission that later remained on the official channels of FGV. Uh, to continue with this transmission, we ask you to express, it's not a really a transmission, we're just recording it, although we do have friends from Kaji watching uh, from Zoom and participating uh, from a distance. Um, so to continue with this, uh, Recording, we ask you to express your agreement by verbalizing or signaling your agreement. So thank you very much for being with us. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have you all here and, and together with Professor Kirsten, you have a, a team of commentators of the, the lecture uh, that are basically stars from the field. So we have Guilherme Ribas, we have Leonor Cordovio and have Anna Bacha Glenk. All of them uh, uh, knowledgeable practitioners. Uh, Leonor is also a colleague of mine here at FGV, a professor here as well. We share a course together, so it's a great pleasure to have you all here with us. And with that, I would give the floor to Hibas. Uh, we're doing this together with Ibrak, with the participation of Ibrak. It's always great to have Ibrak participate in events at FGV. We want to have this intense dialogue with the professional community. And so it's, it's great to have you here, Hibas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Caio. It's a pleasure to be here uh, to, to listen to Professor Christian. Uh, the topic is great. Uh, we are taking uh, that deep look at IBRAC uh, in this uh, topic. And my colleague, Anna Bacha Glenk, is in charge uh, of the working group uh, about this matter. And it's also a pleasure to be here. We have uh, the head of the Linux uh, unit of CADI here with us, Felipe Roquette. So I think it will be uh, fantastic to have this discussion all together. And uh, we are very happy to support FGV, uh, Leonor and Caio. Congratulations for the event. Thank you very much. And welcome, Felipe. Very good to have you here as well. Professor Kirsten, the floor is yours. I'll go up here just to be able to see the screen properly. Bom dia. I really apologize for not being able to speak any more Portuguese. I was told more colloquial um, expressions um, shouldn't be used, and that's all I really picked up in the, in the past week and a half. I really enjoyed being here at FGV, being able to teach, and now it's an absolute pleasure to be here together with you and talk about uh, immunity and um, you need to use this. Sorry, I'll start again. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to talking about uh, immunity with you and maybe to learn from your experiences and your ideas. I will get uh, started with the presentation. Um, yep, it's, it's moving, great. So I'm not going to spend a very long time on introduction because I know I've got experts in the field here. I will not tell you what competition law is and how it works, but I will try and um, make, um, make clear where the problem actually comes from. It's the interplay between public and private enforcement. 
It's um, rather easy. You know public enforcement means enforcing competition law through sanctions, through fines, and private enforcement. That's the injured parties who basically say, we paid too much and we would like our money back, and uh, they enforce competition law through claims for damages primarily. Now, private enforcement relies on public enforcement. Why? Well, in order to privately enforce a claim, you need to show a lot of things. You need to show that you suffered damages, of course, you need to quantify the damages. But before you do that, you need to show there is an infringement of competition law. And how can you show an infringement if you are a private claimant, you don't have the information normally. I mean, there are cases where you do have that, but normally you just don't know about the cartel. The cartel needs to be investigated first, and that is usually done by the public uh, enforcement, by the competition authorities, and they find out about the cartel, they investigate, they find, and then you know about it, and then you can bring a private damage claim. And the very good thing about that is, I, of course, I don't know enough about Brazil, but I will learn today. The important thing in Europe is there is binding effect. Binding effect meaning if the European Commission has issued a decision, that means this decision, finding an infringement and holding someone responsible for that infringement, is binding on the civil courts who adjudicate private damage claims. So that's great, you don't need to prove the infringement anymore. And you can bring what we call a follow-on action. You follow on the, um, the, 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 the decision of the competition authority, you basically piggyback and use that as a stepping stone to bring your own private damage claim. So public enforcement is very important for this. On the other hand, public enforcement relies on leniency applications. How do competition authorities find out about cartels? Very often they find out because someone applies for leniency, goes to the competition authority, confesses to the wrongdoings they have committed, and then they get leniency in return. Then the competition authority can investigate, and then we are back at binding effect and the private claims. However, leniency is very nice and you have an incentive to apply for leniency because then you don't have to pay a fine. On the other hand, I understand from talking to lawyers and competition um, authorities that more and more leniency applicants are concerned about private damage claims. They wonder, is it worth saving the fine if then I am the first getting a decision against me with binding effect and then I am the first to be sued and then I have to pay all the damages. Just to illustrate that in Europe, we had the trucks cartel. The fine was 2.93 billion, billion euros, roughly 2.93 billion US dollars. That's a lot of money in fines. But the damage claims ran into 100 billion euros. 100 billion. So you start wondering, do I want to pay the 100 billion or my share of that and then, you know, not have to pay a fine or do I not? And so private enforcement can deter from leniency applications. And that's basically the issue we are dealing with here. I skipped over a few slides and um, I'm just talking about uh, private enforcement here in the, in the European community setting. I will just remind you of a few basics of European Union law, just in case not everybody has um, heard about that. European Union law in this respect consists of two layers of law. We've got the treaties that establish the European Union, and these treaties concluded by the member states are the primary law. They are at the top of the hierarchy and they contain Articles 101 and 102, the prohibition on cartel and cartels and the prohibition on abuse of dominance. So that's the basic, the fundamental, the primary law. And then we have subordinate laws that derive from the treaties, secondary law, for example, the Cartel Damages Directive. This directive is addressed to the member states. It tells the member states what their laws should look like. 
right? So if we look at the directive, and we will look at Article 11 and other articles of the directive, we don't look at law that is applicable directly. We look at law that tells us what the member states' laws should look like. So if you look at the directive, you have an idea what Portuguese law look, looks like, what French law should look like, and what German and Italian and Spanish law should look like. That's why I always refer to the directive, but you have to keep in mind that's not the law that is really applied. That's the national law that transposes the directive. Okay, so under EU law, under EU competition law, derived from primary law, we have the principle of effectiveness slash effet utile, and that requires that any individual can claim compensation. So it's in the basic fundamental law. Every individual can claim compensation, and the idea is that's how we enforce competition law. We enforce it through sanctions, and we enforce it through um, private actions for damages. And that's a case, uh, Manfredi is from 2004, there is one from 2001. That is very basic and very fundamental. And now since 2014, we have the Cartel Damages Directive. And that as well reiterates this. Everyone, anybody who has suffered harm caused by an infringement has to be able to effectively exercise the right to claim full compensation. And the directive also establishes joint and several liability of every infringer for the damages. Now, I'm just getting right into it. Just to remind everyone of, um, of, of the setup here, we've got the victim and joint and several liability, of course, means that you can claim 100% of your damage from any infringer, right? That's probably not anything that's new to anybody here, and um, that's what it looks like, and that's the primary rule here under the directive. And of course, also the directive says if, you, if someone pays more than their share, then they can require and obtain contribution from the other infringers for their share of responsibility. The victim gets 100% of its damage from infringer one, and infringer one claims contribution from infringers two and three. So that's probably very basic. Now I'm getting to the question of privilege. While in principle the infringers are jointly and severally liable, Article 11, Paragraph 4 of the Directive privileges immunity recipients. There is joint and several liability only to direct and indirect purchasers or providers. So the immunity recipient only is liable towards his own supply chain, his own distribution chain, not to direct purchasers and to indirect purchasers. And there is liability to other injured parties only if these other injured parties cannot obtain full compensation from other cartelists. It is a privilege, there's also a privilege in relation to the other cartelists. It restricts their contribution claims in order to make sure that this immunity works. So the basic idea is if you are an immunity recipient, you're liable only to your own distribution chain, not to any customers of the other cartelists, unless the other cartelists are bankrupt and cannot pay. Just to illustrate that, um, in, in, in very simple um, uh, terms, because that's all we need to know for our purposes here. And now, as we have this immunity, this, um, this, this privilege for immunity recipients, who are, to some extent at least, still liable for their damages, there is a 70 percent decline in leniency applications in Europe and one of the possible perceived reasons is that private damage claims mean that the risk of liability um, actually increases despite the leniency status because they are worried as I said in the beginning about being liable for damages. Now we need to deal with this 
problem, somehow apparently this privilege for immunity recipients is not enough. If you make the policy decision that you want to privilege them, then you have to do it right. And that's what I'm trying to suggest how you do that. But I'll do, what I'm first going to do is I'm going to show that the way we do it right now is not very helpful. First, there are some frictions between the cartel damages directive and the judgments of the European Court of Justice concerning primary law. And there is a hierarchy of norms. At the top, there is primary law. The, and that's what the European Court of Justice interpreted. And then, at a lower level, there is the Cartel Damages Directive. Now, the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, says anybody must be able to claim damages. And the ECJ also says that follows directly from the treaty. We don't need to talk about um, the judgments in detail here. And now, secondary law says, well, yes, you must be able to claim damages, but not from immunity recipients. So under primary law, you can claim damages from the immunity recipients, and under secondary law, you can't. And that might be, or it might lead to the conclusion that the idea of privileging does not work because primary law says, no, you need to be able to claim your damages from all the cartelists. And then secondary law cannot say that you can't claim it from the immunity recipients. So that's the first problem we have with our system at the moment. And then there are also some frictions with fundamental rights. Injured parties suffer the loss of their legal position because if you look at the timeline, First, there's the cartel. Then there is damage inflicted on someone. And if you inflict damage on someone, according to the ECJ, they have a claim for damages. And that claim arises. And it's there. And then later on, the cartel is discovered and someone gets immunity. And only then, when that person gets immunity, the claim against the immunity recipient becomes less valuable, is reduced to some subordinate claim that well, it means it basically ceases to exist because you will not wait for, uh, to, to see if everybody else is bankrupt. So first you have a claim and then this claim is taken away from you basically by a decision of the competition authority. So in the end, the competition authority comes and takes away your damage claim by giving somebody immunity. And if that happens, if the state comes and takes something away from you, you would like to be heard, right? You, would, uh, you, you, want to, you want to make your case that maybe someone else deserves immunity and not the person you wanted to claim damages from. And now let's just imagine the, 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 the trucks cartel or a cartel that affects public transport. Imagine public transport being more expensive because there is some cartel and then everybody who has bought a ticket for a bus is a potential claimant and do you really want to go and ask everybody who bought a bus ticket whether they are okay with somebody getting immunity? That's just impossible. You cannot do that. And maybe that's enough justification not to do it. But how, what are you going to do if that one of these people says, I'm not okay with that catalyst getting immunity. I think somebody else should get immunity. I think you made a mistake giving that person immunity and not another person. How are you going to have judicial review in this respect? That's basically very hard because you will give a hold up position to everybody who claims to be a potential uh, damage, um, who, who claims to have suffered damages. They, if they can appeal the decision to make someone an immunity recipient, the whole system will break down. So you would have to let them do that in civil court and argue it there, which is very, very late on the timeline and which probably, at least to the ECJ, might not be a, a, an efficient guarantee of their rights. So if you, if you look at all this, things get really messy and complicated if you want to guarantee people's 
fundamental rights and uh, adhere to some very basic uh, constitutional principles as well. So, in order to conclude de legalata, uh, to conclude regarding the law in place right now, the privilege in relation to injured parties may not be compatible with primary law. It's highly questionable under constitutional law. And finally, really, is it reasonable in terms of policy? Why do we take measures at the expense of the injured parties? What did they do? I mean, the, all they did was they suffered damages, and why should they now um, be, be, be used to incentivize leniency applications? You can make arguments for that by saying, well, they wouldn't have anything at all if there were no leniency applications. I get that. But I think there is a much easier and much better way to do that. And that's what I am suggesting. I am suggesting to grant immunity recipients a privilege in relation to the other infringers. That's what the law should look like. So my idea would be to let the immunity recipient be fully liable in relation to the injured parties without any privilege, joint and several liability for immunity recipients. And in relation to the other infringers, to the other cartelists, you can give the immunity recipient contribution claims. And we could expand these contribution claims and say the leniency recipient can claim full compensation, full contribution from other cartelists for settling damage claims of the injured parties. So in the end, the immunity recipient doesn't pay a fine, doesn't have to pay damages, well, has to pay damages to the injured parties, but gets that money back from the other cartelists. So in the end, there is zero to pay, and that would provide a great incentive to come forward and make a leniency application. So the advantages are the injured parties get to keep their damages claims. There is no conflict with primary law. And that's maybe not that important for our context here. I'm just arguing that it would not be against the cartel damages directive to do that, but that's for the European discussion and maybe not for our discussion here. If you've got any questions regarding that, we can maybe discuss that later. Also advantages. Regarding the legal remedies, the privilege doesn't affect the injured parties anymore. And so you don't have to give the injured parties any legal remedies. Not every single person who ever took a bus has to be asked about the granting a leniency application or loses a claim and is probably or, 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 or is entitled to argue that in court and to ask for a judicial review. We don't need to worry about that anymore. And Sure, the other catalysts are affected. They might not like it, but the decision is addressed to them as well. And so they have a public law remedy. They get a decision saying, you did it, you are an infringer, and you are not an immunity recipient, whereas somebody else is a immun an immunity recipient. And they can appeal against that decision, have judicial review, they have the right to be heard, and it all works within the smaller circle of the cartelists, and I think that's very doable uh, for competition authorities uh, and to, to deal with that, because I think they're already dealing with that at the moment. It's, there is no additional work involved. A greater incentive for infringers, I've already mentioned that. And you get the possibility, because you can start playing with the numbers now, you get the possibility of saying, well, for policy considerations, maybe the immunity recipient should not get 100% immunity from damages claims, maybe just 80%, because we don't want to privilege them all the way for policy considerations. You can do that. You just play with the numbers a little. And also, in this system, you are able to grant some privilege as well to the second and the third cartelist coming forward and making a leniency application. They might not get immunity, but they might get a reduction in fine, and we could also give them some privilege regarding the damages claims. 
because I hear from competition authorities that they seem to find that they need the second and the third leniency applicant to fully prove their case, to really uh, investigate everything properly. And so if they need an incentive as well, we could easily do that. There are a number of ways of doing that, just possibilities here. You can say the immunity recipient gets full compensation in relation to the other infringers, full contribution claims. You could give partial compensation, just mentioned that. You can, in addition to those two first, you can also incentivize the second and the third and this is again just something for the European uh, discussion. While we still have the directive in this respect saying you should privilege them um, in relation to the injured parties, I would say it's not against the directive to give people an option, to give cartelists an option and say I opt out of this privilege and I opt in to the new one. But that again is just for the European discussion, how we get around the directive at the moment. Not get around it, but um, use it so that um, it, it, it allows us to, to move to a better system. So for us, points one to three here are the important ones. And now, sorry, that's very, very small uh, to read and we don't need to go into the details here. This is just some examples how the math would work. And I agree it looks complicated. And in order to explain this fully, I'd have to go to my, to my notes here and I'd have to start really properly and slowly explaining this. What I'm trying to do now is I'm just trying to show you it works out. It's an Excel table and um, we've got the liability quota according to the um, participation in the cartel. I just took the turnover and say if Catalyst A participated to 50% in the cartel, turnover 50%, got a reduction of fine of 100% and we want to transfer that reduction to 100% um, into a privilege as regards damages claims, then the individual liability quota of A afterwards in damages claims would be 0%. The others would have 50% but that means we need to make these quotas higher so that, there is, uh, that, that the whole liability is distributed. And then you just work your way down here and it works out very well. Please do not consider this rather complicated looking Excel table to be a, uh, an argument against my suggestion here. I think the idea is very simple. Go and privilege immunity recipients in relation to the other catalysts. Let the other catalysts pay. That's the very simple idea. And this looks complicated, but it's just to show you that the math works. And I've got more slides like that. You know, the math also works if you just give a partial internal compensation claim. And it also works if you give an additional privilege for the co-catalysts who come as a second and a third leniency applicant. Again, I'm not going to go through the math with you. I've, I've got complicated formulas and slides, but the idea is it's the idea is simple, and it works if you put it in an Excel table, and you can tweak it so that it really fits your needs. You can play with the quotas, and um, you can make sure that it works for your needs. And I am I've got some alternative proposals here. Um, that there should be full exemption here or full immunity there. I'm not going to discuss them in detail because they all suffer from the same problem. If you, if, you, if, you, if you make the injured parties pay, you will have to hear them, you will have to give them a possibility of judicial review and you are taking something away from them that they are guaranteed under primary law and in Europe, there is no chance of changing primary law. So I think these proposals do not really help and I'm looking forward to our discussion now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kirsting. I think this is a very uh, interesting discussion. I think it's very timely for Brazil as well. We have just had a change uh, uh, in our law uh, last year as well that has some tweaks uh, to the incentives uh, here regarding uh, um, private enforcement and how to treat the leniency applicants as well. So let's, let's go to our commentators here. So if I may, I'll start with Anabacha Glenk. Anabacha is uh, a partner at Machado Meyer. Uh, she's also leading uh, the cartel working group in, in Iraq. So thank you very much for being with us uh, here, Anna, and the floor is yours. Kaya, thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. It's a pleasure to uh, be in this uh, table with uh, such amazing practitioners and uh, in particular with Professor Kerstin. Uh, thank you very much for the proposal. Uh, that was very enlightening and very interesting because I would never have thought on, on, on such a proposal. So there are some things uh, that, that come to my mind with this proposal. So first of all, uh, and maybe I'm with the Brazilian mind of how courts work, um, how do you think this would work in relation to um, jurisdiction and different courts? So for instance, if um, uh, the leniency applicant uh, is uh, uh, under a lawsuit in one jurisdiction, let's say Germany, and has to pay there. And then the other infringers are in other jurisdictions, let's say Italy, Spain, and so on. Uh, would those lawsuits in relation to those other infringers have to be in Germany or in those other jurisdictions? And why I'm asking that is, is because we, I believe we have a similar, would have a similar problem here in Brazil as well, which would be, there are some courts and some jurisdictions that are more advanced and are uh, faster and so on. And wouldn't, so if we consider, and I'm assuming that the German courts are probably more efficient than Italian or Spanish courts or Bulgarian courts, I don't know, um, wouldn't that mean that the leniency applicant could be uh, liable to pay those injuries uh, in Germany, let's say, and then would have a problem and difficulties to, to obtain this payment again in relation to the other infringers in other countries? That, that, that's just one thing that came to my mind. And of course, we can discuss later also the law here in Brazil so that we can check how, how it would work because our law has different um, dispositions. But that's just the th first thing that uh, mm -hmm. came to my mind. So if I, if, that way. if I understood you correctly, the question is how will the contribution claims be enforced if in one jurisdiction um, uh, the, the, the immunity recipient pays damages and then wants to claim contribution from the other catalysts. I, I, I see the problem. Um, it might be a bigger problem for Europe than for Brazil because we don't have one single um, one single private law system. We would have to rely on the, on, on, on the, on the rules, or harmonized rules from a directive and we would need to change the directive first. I agree. Um, however, the, I think the most important point is that the decision who is the immunity recipient has been taken and that that decision um, triggers everything else that follows from it. So once that decision is clear, um, under Bulgarian law it is clear as well that the immunity recipient who has paid damages can claim contribution. And of course it can always be the case that it's difficult to actually enforce the contribution claim. Um, 
but that's just the price you have to pay for being in a cartel. And I don't think it is any more difficult than enforcing a normal contribution claim they would have if they were not an immunity recipient. You always have the problem. You are a, um, a catalyst who is jointly and severally liable. You pay damages and then you have to claim contribution. And uh, what I'm changing here is only the amount of contribution you can claim. I say, well, you can claim everything back. And whether you do that in a Bulgarian court or in a Lithuanian court or in a German court, that doesn't really matter. But you're always bound to, um, to, to, to make sure you get your uh, money. And I have to admit, I have not really thought about the, um, the jurisdictional questions of contribution claims. I mean, the jurisdictional questions regarding uh, where you can claim your damages as, a, as an injured party, uh, they are being clarified and there are cases on that. I have not seen a case yet where the jurisdictional question regarding contribution claims has, uh, has really come up, but that might be me not being uh, well-versed well enough in, 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 in jurisdictional questions, but um, yeah, I hope I answered that uh, yes, to your satisfaction. You, thank you very much, Professor. Actually, I think it would be good for the discussion as well to explain a little bit how it is in Brazil. Uh, we don't have so many uh, private uh, uh, enforcement as in Germany, mm -hmm. as in other countries. That's relatively new in Brazil, even though uh, lawsuits are possible since the enactment of the Brazilian competition law, it was only recently, uh, based on a recent new law, that dispositions became more clearly, and also that other dispositions came uh, to actually um, um, give some privileges to not only uh, signatories of leniency agreements, but also in Brazil in, in relation to signatories of settlement mm -hmm. agreements mm -hmm. with the Brazilian authorities. So in Brazil, first of all, in relation to lawsuits, uh, there are double damages, which is something new in Brazil because usually here um, injured parties can only file a suit for the specific amount uh, uh, of, of injury. Um, there is joint and several liability between infringers. Uh, three, there is um, this question on pass-through. So what, and if there is a question of pass-through, uh, the, the investigated entity has the burden of proof, right? So that uh, in order to make it better mm -hmm. for uh, injured parties. There's also more clarity in relation to statute of limitations. Um, before there were lawsuits that were dismissed by courts in Brazil, actually right before the enactment of this law, just because the, the judges uh, uh, were, were thinking about statute of limitations based on the uh, end of the cartel, which would be crazy because uh, some cartels only uh, came up and were known by others uh, several years later. Mm -hmm. Um, what else? Uh, and then in relation to, to, to those signatories, so uh, of, of leniency agreements and of settlements, what are the benefits? So the main benefit is that in relation to them, there are no double damages. It's only the exact amount of damage and they are not joint and severally liable. So if there is an injured party, this injured party can claim from the um, uh, leniency applicant only the amount that this leniency applicant uh, um, was uh, responsible for. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a um, difference here because so in Brazil, uh, it wouldn't be possible for a, an injured party to go to the, um, to the leniency applicant and, and as the leniency applicant uh, damages uh, based on the, uh, that, that were due to the other infringers. Um, and there is this demo, double damage, uh, which actually escalates things um, here in Brazil. Mm -hmm. So the injured party could actually, if you think about it, 
maybe because it's double damages, uh, obtain a high amount from other infringers rather than the, the, the leniency applicant. Mm -hmm. But one thing that, at least in my opinion, um, actually doesn't make the rule so good for uh, injured parties is that it applies not only to the leniency applicant, but also to all infringers that uh, entered into settlement agreements with CADE, which in some cartel cases are almost all infringers, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that would be, it, it, it makes, uh, the, uh, that's, that's another element that makes it a bit more complicated. So that's just, uh, I'll leave it to, to Guilherme and Leonor for other comments, but just so that we have the basis for our debate here and to tell you a little bit more about the Brazilian, uh, Brazilian law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just, just maybe two words. That's really interesting. And uh, the idea, double damages reduced to, 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 to normal um, individual damages, uh, again, uh, for leniency, recipients, I would say now not applicants, because giving it to everybody just really defeats the purpose a little. But um, double damages when reducing that um, as a privilege for leniency recipients, I think that's, that's a good idea. It's an idea that probably would not work in Europe as um, we have this strict idea of no overcompensation. However, that idea just comes from the directive, not necessarily from the treaty, so we, we, we could change that if we wanted to. I don't think there would be um, uh, there, 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 there would be a majority for that, but I, I think that's uh, that, that's something one could think about, and um, uh, no joint and several liability. Um, I understand that. I find it a bit difficult to understand because I think you mentioned some causality requirements, like uh, you can only claim it um, from uh, for, from infringers who have caused your damage. But I would wonder whether everybody, every infringer did not cause the damage. O only in relation to the signatories of leniency application and settlement. So in right. relation to all other uh, infringers, where there are infringers yeah. that didn't sign, they are jointly and severally liable. So the injured parties could actually uh, claim all damages from one of the infringers, and then such infringer mm -hmm. would have to um, sue the other infringers in order to obtain right. um, the, the proportional share. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah and th I think this, this is something that we still need to check how it's gonna really going to work, right? I mean, because when, when you say, when the law says, right, that you're just responsible for the damages uh, 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 directly caused uh, 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 there, I think it's even less clear than the European, the European directive that says uh, uh, just those that suffered, uh, 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 it, it, it's the singular person that actually bought from that particular, that particular uh, uh, um, cartelist, right? So I think in Brazil we haven't tested that yet. And the other thing that's gonna be interesting is the contribution claims against the immunity applicants, right? When you pay, you're joint and severally liable, you pay fully the damages, and then you go after the cartelist and you say, look, you have a portion of that that is exactly the sales that you had to certain injured parties, right? And if that injured party is seeking damages from a third, from another one, then you're gonna have to isolate those particular damages and go after the contribution claim of the immunity applicant. I think that's gonna be a particularly interesting uh, discussion as well. But let's, let's move on to our other uh, um, commentators here. So Leonor Cordovil, uh, is a founding partner of um, Greenberg Cordovil and also a professor and my colleague here at FGV. So thank you very much for being here today, uh, Leonor, and participating with us. Thank you for the invitation, Caio. And thank you, Professor, for being us here with us today and, uh, and, uh, and for the presentation and the research. It's very interesting for us, and especially as Ana uh, mentioned at this moment in Brazil, that it's really a hot topic for all of us. And uh, my question, uh, it's just uh, in, in addition to what Ana has just mentioned about the treble damages and double damages, uh, you mentioned already that in, in Europe, uh, Europe uh, struggles uh, with the idea of overcompensation. If you can tell us more about this, because when we imagine our system in Brazil, uh, the, I, I, when I was uh, watching your presentation, I was following your presentation, I was just thinking maybe uh, exactly like in Brazil that we follow the US, uh, the perspective, uh, 
we, I think all of us agree with the idea that we need to uh, privilege the immunity, immunity cartelists, but the idea was exactly like, uh, as we cannot change uh, and, uh, and give them a better situation than the others, why not give the, the others the worst situation? So it was exactly my question, why did you, did you think about this in your research? But then uh, I have a, a second question here about the possibility, uh, in a, in a, it's, a, it's a big problem in Brazil, uh, about the, uh, uh, who are we going to, 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 to understand as co cartelists So at what moment uh, in Europe, for example, we can really go against uh, and, and file for compensation, uh, if you can tell us more about this, and also uh, the idea of uh, the value, the, the calculation, how is it going in Europe? Maybe you can tell us, just if I can. Uh, another thing I was, uh, sorry for asking all possible questions. Uh, and uh, the, the, okay, <laughs> and the thing about the 70% that you mentioned, uh, it's a decline. And I think it's, this is more tricky because I have uh, read articles about what is it declining. And I think it's nobody really knows exactly, right? And for example, here in Brazil, it's strange because we don't have, uh, it's new for us, and so we don't have private enforcement. We have it, but it is still uh, really embryonic in Brazil, but we are seeing the decline. So, or at least we have the, Philippi maybe can correct us, but uh, at least from our perspective, we're seeing a, a, a decline or a, a trying, we're not seeing so many leniencies as we had in the past. So our idea, I was thinking that maybe we have the same problems, but not the same causes. And uh, I would like to hear about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first, no overcompensation. Uh, where does that come from? It does not really come from the case law of the European Court of Justice. In the Manfredi case I, I mentioned on the slide, there was also another question of whether punitive damages were available, and the court just said, well, if they are available under national law for infringements of national competition law, they must also be available for infringements of European competition law. There was no indication that the court would frown upon punitive damages uh, per se. Um, they, were, they just weren't introduced and um, then the directive came and of course uh, such a law is the result of many negotiations between different stakeholders and um, um, the, the general idea is we want to get it perfectly right and I, I don't think it's a good idea because it's just not possible I mean if you if someone runs over your foot in a car accident um, there is no way of getting it perfectly right to um, estimate and, and then to really uh, say you suffered so and so much pain and will compensate you from that there's no way of getting it 100% right and in the context of cartels it's even more difficult I would say because um, what, what, what the directive says, no overcompensation plus no undercompensation. So we really need to get it right. And then if you think about a pass-on, then you not just have to quantify 100% correctly, but you also have to really figure out where in the distribution chain chain is the damage now how much was passed on on each level and um, then you need to figure that out and then you need to quantify pass on and you need to quantify the overcharge and you need to quantify a volume effect i think that is really really hard and probably impossible to do that but that's what's behind the directive and uh, um, also, if you have different courts working on a cartel, that's another problem. One court might estimate this way, the other court might estimate that way. Um, uh, the um, uh, defendants might be more successful to argue pass on in that court than in another court. And it, I think it's just very, very difficult to get it 100% right, but that's the idea of the directive. Uh, I always suspect that um, the idea is to say at some point later, well, we try to get it right, it doesn't really work, so what we need is collective redress, we need class actions to just um, balance this out and get it into one, uh, one procedural, um, uh, procedural claim in one court and adjudicate it um, all together. That might work much better. I'm in favor of class actions there, but the directive does not require class actions because there was no, there was no agreement, no consensus that uh, we should have class actions. So um, things are still in flux there. We are trying to get it right and um, we're doing our best there, but I don't think it really works very well. 
Um, who is the co-catalyst? I would say it's and from a, from a practitioner's point of view, you would probably argue it's the people addressed in the decision and you go after them. Of course, you could always try and make your case that there is another catalyst the competition authority hasn't found yet and I want to hold that person responsible as well. Yes, but I don't think that's going to happen uh, very often. And so I would say if you want to look for the co-catalyst, look in the decision and um, go for the addressees there. Uh, calculation of damages, I've already said a few things about that. As you know, that's really, really hard. And um, my idea would be, let's have a presumption. And not, I mean, we do have a presumption already that cartels cause harm. So there is a presumption, but it's not a presumption as regards quantum. So the only presumption we have, there is harm, but we don't know how much. And I think we should go one step further and just, you know, pick a number. Say 5%, say 10, say 15, say 20, maybe not more than 20, but um, pick a number and make things easier, more calculable, um, so more foreseeable for both parties. Um, Hungary and I think Romania and another country, I think it's maybe one of the Baltic states, they have a presumption of between, I think, 10 or 20%. And uh, I think that's a good idea to, to, to have that. I mean, lawyers for the defendants will argue it's a bad idea, but um, I th I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I can, I can make that argument. And finally, the reasons for the decline. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I hear lawyers arguing, well, that's because the compliance system we implement works so well. There are no more cartels. Yes, that's the reaction you get from enforcers then. And um, I, I really don't know. There might be some COVID-related um, reasons behind that. There, there, I, I simply don't know that. So I always say, if you make the policy decision that you want a privilege for catalysts, then do it my way. But uh, I, 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 I do understand if you say they don't deserve it and um, it's, it's enough that they don't have to pay the fine. But if you do make that policy decision, then I think you should make the privilege work against the other catalysts and not against the injured parties. Thank you very much, uh, Leonor and Professor Kirsten. And now we have uh, Guilherme Ribas. Guilherme is a partner at Tozini and also the director of competition at IBRAC. So thank you very much for being here with us, Guilherme. Thanks, Kai, again. Uh, and thank you, Professor. It's a very, very, very interesting topic. And I think uh, I have many questions, Leonor, as well. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I try to, 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 to concentrate on a few so, so the, the audience can also uh, make some questions. Uh, but I think that, um, first of all, it's good to have someone uh, from, from law schools uh, thinking about this matter, which I think it's a very important one. And it's the, the main uh, problem we face all around the world in relation to uh, cartel enforcement. Um, I think that our authorities are dedicated to, to, to think about that in uh, improving the, the leniency system in Brazil and worldwide because we need to have something changing, uh, otherwise uh, uh, we will come back to the early 2000s and 90s uh, where the authorities uh, uh, investigated based on uh, uh, news, on, on, on newspapers, and uh, uh, so uh, we need to do something. I agree with Leonor, uh, we have the numbers, like last uh, Friday we had a seminar uh, uh, promoted by, by Kaji. Uh, about the, the the 20 years of the first leniency agreement in Brazil, which was uh, uh, executed in uh, 2003. And um, they mentioned that now they have uh, 10 uh, leniency negotiations uh, uh, going on. Um, uh, but, but we feel as uh, practitioners uh, a decrease in the number. Uh, we had uh, high numbers with the Lava Jato, the car wash uh, uh, operation in Brazil. Um, in the, between uh, 14 and, uh, and 20, uh, but so we had a, a, a huge number of uh, leniency cases uh, negotiated at that time, but we feel that other cases are, are, are decreasing a lot. Uh, 
the reasons why I think that uh, uh, the culture of compliance is, is one, uh, I don't know, uh, the, the exact percentage of, uh, 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 but I think it's a, it's an important one. Um, uh, but I think that uh, claim, the damaged claims are in the center of uh, of this problem. And that's what we hear from from clients all the time uh, when applying for for leanness. Uh, this is uh, in the center, especially when we deal with uh, international cases. Uh, and uh, so I, I will just uh, make some comments uh, uh, about Brazil, so you can have the, the comparison. In Brazil, we are much more focused, and as you in in, in Europe were, uh, uh, focused on uh, public enforcement. Private enforcement is something new. We had this uh, this change in law described very well by by Anna. Um, but we are uh, we are in our beginning. In, in relation to private damages. Uh, so we are starting, we have several claims right now uh, starting, especially claims uh, uh, interrupting the, the status of limitation so they can wait for, for CAD's final decision to, to begin discussions on damages. Uh, we have several of them uh, here in Brazil. Uh, so we are seeing a new area of uh, private enforcement. It's still to, to, to have the the, the main uh, points of uh, how the judicial courts uh, will, will deal with that. We will see that uh, uh, in the future, I don't know, perhaps in two or four years, uh, we have more elements uh, uh, to describe. But I, I think that we have uh, two uh, different types of uh, cartels here, as you have in Europe. Uh, the domestic cartels uh, and the international cartels. Uh, so in relation to domestic cartels, we, we, we have uh, the problem of uh, private enforcement, uh, and also the, the uh, a problem in relation to to the relationship between the authorities, especially when we deal with uh, 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 bid rigging cases, uh, which are the majority of the, the cartel cases uh, we have in Brazil. Uh, not the majority, but a relevant part of it. So uh, we have also other authorities in charge of negotiating uh, uh, agreements, uh, uh, compensation by, by public agents, and this is uh, a, 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 a hot topic here. Clients uh, uh, are, are really upset with the, 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 the arrangement, the institutional arrangements of negotiation multiple agreements uh, uh, among these authorities, and this is causing clearly uh, 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 a decrease in the incentive of negotiating domestic cartels, especially when we have uh, bit rigging cases. Uh, and international cases, uh, what we see here, it's, um, and talking now as a, as a, as a practitioner, uh, what we see here is that people, um, uh, leniency applicants are concerned about the, 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 the quality and the volume of information they will share with, the, uh, with CAD here because they are afraid of, uh, of claims in, uh, in England, in the Netherlands, and all uh, over the uh, the world. So uh, the, the authorities here in Brazil are, are, are know about this, this problem, are concerned about this problem. Um, at the same time, uh, we have the incentive to provide uh, more information, more documents, so the scope of the protection is wider. Uh, but now with uh, uh, claims, uh, damage claims, uh, we, we feel that uh, uh, we have to be more uh, uh, we, we have to, 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 to be more, uh, uh, not so robust uh, when providing, because this, uh, at least in Brazil, these documents will become uh, uh, available to everyone after, uh, after the, the, this, the final decision by CAD. And, uh, and what we see is that uh, the claimants uh, all over the world, especially in, in the UK and, and the Netherlands, the, the main jurisdictions, uh, dealing with Brazilian cases uh, or uh, uh, international cases, uh, but they use a lot of uh, uh, documents uh, from our leanest uh, uh, applica uh, uh, applications here. Uh, so we, we, we are now having this uh, 
uh, this uh, problem of incentive of how we deal with uh, having a broader scope of protection and uh, uh, also protecting the clients in relation to future claims that uh, may arise. And um, this, uh, well, this is just uh, some comments uh, about Brazil, but um, uh, thinking about your proposal, uh, I think it's, uh, my first reaction is that it, it may work very well when we think about uh, European-wide uh, cartels. Um, but perhaps when we think about uh, uh, international cartels where we may have uh, immunity granted for company A in, in the US and for company B in Brazil and for company C in, in, in Europe, uh, perhaps uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, the proposal may, may bring uh, different incentives for, for not cooperating with foreign authorities. So only company C will, would be uh, more uh, uh, incentivized to cooperate uh, because they will uh, be in a better position in Europe, but, uh, but then uh, company A and company uh, B may not um, uh, search for leniency in, in the US and Brazil and Korea and other main jurisdictions. So, so just uh, uh, do you think that there may be a different incentive for, for uh, when we deal in a European uh, uh, white uh, case and, and, and a, a broader one? Uh, another question I have uh, is uh, in relation to the to the human rights uh, uh, court. Uh, uh, just to, uh, curiosity, if there was any discussion there that uh, dealing with uh, compensation or um, or something like that, because you mentioned that. Uh, but I perhaps just only to mention the the, the rights in the charge. Uh, uh, but to just a curiosity. Um, and uh, and the final question that uh, your your last suggestion uh, you mentioned about internal and external uh, uh, privilege um, and just uh, I, 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 it do, do not uh, work for us uh, very well but I I'm curious about to hear about what you mean about internal and uh, uh, external privilege thank you very much thank you Guilherme. Thanks. That was uh, that was a lot, and uh, maybe I can start with a few of um, the remarks you made um, regarding regarding Brazil, because that touches on on an issue we've been uh, discussing in Europe as well, and um, that was the question of documents becoming available to to everybody. Um, we had these cases before the directive um, uh, came about and was implemented, and uh, the cases basically said that uh, competition authorities could protect leniency documents, but they would have to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether to release them to potential claimants. So there was a balancing exercise going on. The court recognized it's important to keep them secret in order to keep um, leniency attractive, and on the other hand, the court realized, well, the information is necessary for the claimants. And then the directive came and the directive very clearly says we do not share any uh, leniency applications or um, even settlement uh, documents. And uh, so there was a very clear policy decision taken that we do not share those uh, information with, with, with anybody. Whatever is in the immunity application or in the settlement submission um, is, is off limits. And, um, of course, that collides with the earlier judgment, and the judgments refer to higher-ranking law than the directive is, and so there is still the issue, does that really hold up in court? Um, I think it should hold up because it's a good policy decision not to share that, but we'll have to see. So it's very interesting for me to hear that Brazil just you know, makes it public and um, makes it available to other jurisdictions um, as well. Um, regarding your, um, your, your question, um, of course, it's, it's, it's easier if you apply a system like that in one jurisdiction. Whenever um, it becomes an international case, things get messier, and things get more difficult, and especially in, in cartel cases where we have the um, the, 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 the application of, of, of national law based on effects in the country. 
uh, on the markets in the country, then suddenly you have got many jurisdictions competing for, um, for, for applying their own law and then things, things do get difficult. Um, I'll have to think of your, about your question a bit more, but uh, my first uh, question to you in this case would be, do you think it would be more difficult than in the um, system we have now? Because we already have a system with a privilege for immunity um, recipients. It's just that the privilege works against the injured parties, and now it would work against the other catalysts, against fewer. Um, party. So my hunch would be it's at least not going to be more difficult than before. But again, I'd have to th I'd have to think about that and um, see whether there are any disincentives uh, involved. Um, regarding the Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights, the only argument I made there was that if you take something away from somebody normally you would need to hear these people and you would have to give them a chance to have it reviewed in court. And if that's taken away from you, then I think there is a problem and you need to address that somehow because I think that's just a fundamental notion of fairness as well that you can't just take things and, um, I mean, and not compensate either. Because if it's, if it's some kind of eminent domain, then you would owe compensation and then the whole system wouldn't work either. Um, I think it's a clear indication that we should move to a different system, be it reducing double damages to single damages or be it um, um, using some, some, some internal privilege. And that brings me to your last question. I think that's just a question of, of wording. I say it's an internal privilege against the other catalysts and it's external if you uh, let it operate against the injured parties. It's just a, just a, just a, just a wording question. Right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kirstein. Thank you, Guilherme Hibas, and all the commentators. I, I think this issue of like how difficult or or easy it becomes, I think it's extremely important in Brazil. I mean, like if we had this system that we're proposing here, that you shift the privilege to the contribution claims, right? And 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 which which seems fair uh, to a large extent. We do have to factor in the complexity of our courts, right? I mean, if you, if you put the immunity applicant to respond joint and severably, and then to seek full compensation to the others, this could take ages to go through. And, and in practice, it could lead, it could be easier for the injured parties to go after the immunity applicant, and then they could have, lead to much more time to go after the other cartelists and to get that, that funding back, even if it's fair, it could be such a long time to go through courts that could be complicated for that and could be a disincentive for immunity. So we need to factor in like the efficiency of the courts or, or not. I think that's an additional point and, and that's the only point I'm going to make and then shift to our audience to see if we have questions uh, here. I think we have a super qualified audience so uh, we should hear them. Um, two points in, in response to your, your concern there. Uh, first of all, you're right, that could take a long time. And so my first reply would be, well, you did something you shouldn't have done. And um, so you've got to live with some adverse consequences of that. And I mean, you're already getting off with basically zero. So you do have to live with this problem. But also, um, if, if you know ex ante, if you know beforehand that this is how it works and uh, you have a very clear vision how it's going to work, maybe it will make it easier to come to an out-of-court settlement and to, to just sort these things out before you have to litigate them all the way through. Um, but I agree it might take some time, but it also might provide an incentive knowing that in the end I don't have to pay anything. I will be able to, to, to get it back and I will negotiate with my co-catalyst and we will find a way of uh, making things easier. I suppose uh, if, you, if, if, you, if you are faced with these claims, you will have to make provisions for them in your books and in your accounts. And you might want to get rid of that rather sooner than later. And that might also provide an incentive to just sit down and figure it out. And the easier and more foreseeable things are, the easier it will be to figure it out. But again, we'll have to see how that plays out. I, I, I agree with that. 
Thank you, thank you. So let's open uh, um, for questions of the audience. Um, as I said, we have people that are extremely knowledgeable in the subject here, so please. Okay. okay. Is there another mic there? We'll give it back to you. Thank you. Good morning. Do you hear me well? Yes. yes. Okay, so my question is um, to Professor Kirsten about your proposal. Uh, because I was thinking that this is as much a matter of money as it is of time. And, uh, well, after all, money has a different value over time. And when the leniency applicant receives the leniency, uh, well, it receives it, it, it kind of paints a huge red target on its back and says, come ask for compensation from me. And in your proposal, the solution is the compensation here is that you can... Um, receive all of this back from the other cartelists. Is, I'm, uh, okay. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is if maybe we can solve the the difficulty of the efficiency of courts and uh, or at least try to to minimize this by um, creating procedural rules that would um, make it faster for the the leniency recipient to receive this back. And for instance, one that came up that came to me was. To, to bring the other cartelists into the, the suit from the beginning, and uh, if maybe the, the competition authority comes to a conviction before the, um, the c compensation claim is, is uh, followed through, then they can substitute the leniency applicant directly within the same suit, or um, if there would be other procedural rules that could allow for such faster solutions instead of having to go and and claim this back maybe bringing them earlier on and and I, I don't know if this would open opportunities for them to to make the the suit much longer than it had to be or uh, if this would run into the problem of of making the the injured parties um depriving them of their claims which is the the problem you're trying to solve but uh, th that was my question Thank you very much. I like, uh, I like your approach. I, I like your ideas there. Um, I think, yes, there is a target on the back of the leniency applicant. However, I wonder whether practitioners would really bring the case against the leniency applicant before there is a decision. And if there is a decision, the decision will be against all other cartelists as well. And then I think many other factors will come into play. You will ask yourself, where do I want to bring my suit? Will I not rather sue a cartelist in my home state and then I can, uh, you know, my, my own procedural law and the law I know and I don't have to hire another lawyer in another member state and so on. So maybe the target on the back is not as bright as it used to be, especially, and that goes back to the statute of limitation question you brought up, a, um, an investigation suspends limitation. And so you don't have to worry about that anymore. You can really wait until the decision is issued and that's when limitation period starts to run again and then you've got a long time um, to wait and see. And then maybe as a practitioner you will think about other factors as well because you've got the binding decision, you can go for anybody. And then you will ask yourself, is it jurisdiction that matters to me? Is it maybe information I have? Is it maybe that I maybe do not want to sue the guy I bought from because I want to buy from him again. I don't want to, you know, cause bad blood here. There, there will be many factors. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is, I think it makes sense if you as a leniency recipient are being sued to give notice of that suit to the others and make the result of the claim binding on the others. You might even um, uh, find a procedural way of bringing your contribution claim directly within that proceeding. I think that's a, that's a great idea and I'd have to think about whether that's possible under, under, under German law. I, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a professor of procedural law. I'd have to talk to my colleagues about that. But uh, I think that's, that, that's a great idea and it would make things um, quicker and, and, and more efficient. Yeah, I think that's, that's it. Thank you. Anybody else? Comments, questions, insights? Thank you. 
Arthur. Hi. Um, uh, sometimes we we are used to see like the run for lenience as a positive thing, as companies rush for uh, for uh, uh, denouncing practices and cartels. So, but I think that not, it's not all the case. As we discussed the car wash operation, we saw a multiplicity of agreements who end up in, I would say, in some kinds of contradictions or even to be declared void. There's a discussion that within the Brazilian government. So I was under, wondering how could this affect the, the way that we see compensation here? So we could discuss how the, like Tony say, uh, how to uh, how the, the target of compensation, how the, the the bring of attention for the compensation, could even um, I would say uh, make may, maybe create a vicious cycle of running for for lenses here. So a company starts to 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 denounce a practice, and then another one denounce the same practice, or even a similar one, or a complementary one. That's maybe the question here. This one. Um, thank, thank you very much. Um, I think I might need some more background on, on Brazilian law. What, what I understood from your question is there is a multitude of, of leniency applications and they come one after the other and then. In similar markets. That? In similar or complementary markets. So it's, a, it's, it's a not the same cartel. Problem. Yeah, yeah. It's a problem of the limitation of the, 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 the precise cartel. Okay, so okay. It was civil construction, then we would say, okay. Ah, I see. So, so what you're trying to do as a as a as a defendant uh, there is you're trying to say I want leniency too because it's a similar cartel but not the same cartel so I can receive leniency as well. Um, yeah, that, that that's a problem, but that probably is something you need to deal with under your leniency program and um, figure out how to do that and uh, tell tell potential applicants before and that's how we are going to operate and that's how we are going to delineate markets and um, um, I, I don't really, I mean th th that's a problem you need to solve at another level. I don't think it's a problem you can solve at the level of how much or, or what kind of privilege you want to grant. It's uh, one step earlier than that and um, you just have to probably define very clearly what is the first person going to get, what's the second person going to get, and how do we define the markets here. And I suppose defining the markets in this case, you would just have to um, do it as you always do it, because uh, if, if you find them afterwards, you will have to look at the market and um, um, then just be consistent there. That, that would be my, 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 my very unhelpful <laughs> answer, I'm sorry. Any more questions? Comments? No? Yep. João? Um, so, I would like to ask you if in European law there is any role played by public prosecutors in this damage claims that comes after a competition uh, issue because here in Brazil this is a possibility is still highly debatable uh, even after the last year's uh, law changes but I think that covers some uh, problems like you said in public transportation when individual users have no uh, they have no interest in moving a lawsuit to recover a small amount of money but on the same sense, the public prosecutor can take up this uh, uh, this role and move this damage claim on itself. And I think that companies, uh, especially here in Brazil, they tend to be afraid of the public prosecution's uh, way of doing things. And I think that can be a, a, an extra incentive. So I, I don't know how that plays in Europe. I would like to know if, if there is something of this sort. Just complain. This is a very interesting question here. We have this uh, the public prosecution office, uh, and um, uh, Caio knows uh, because we are in, in the same case. Um, 
the, the, the public prosecutors from, from a state in the northeast of Brazil, uh, they filed a lawsuit, uh, damage claim. It's not damage claim, it's moral damage because of cartel activities. And um, uh, so we have these different uh, nuances in Brazil, which are very interesting questions. Thank you. That was uh, that was a very good uh, point, and I, I, I like to talk about that. But I cannot really do that from a European perspective. I will have to shift to a German perspective here because I know that better, and um, I have not seen any public prosecution, public enforcement regarding the damages claims from from the Commission. As far as I know, they don't do that. Um, what happens is that, um, first of all, I'm speaking about German law now, um, there is the question of disgorgement of profits. So uh, the idea, and that's a general idea, is that uh, crime shouldn't pay. Maybe I exaggerated by calling it a crime, but uh, illicit behavior shouldn't pay. And uh, that means you should find them and you must make sure they don't get to keep the profits because otherwise they pay the fine from their profits and um, would even say, well, I'll do it again because you know profits are bigger than the fine. So you really have to make sure that you take away the profits and you can either do that by making the fine large enough so that you disgorge the profits that way, or you can have a separate disgorgement proceeding. Just uh, And um, this separate disgorgement proceeding is provided for in German law. You can either take it away by having a really large fine, or you have a separate disgorgement proceeding. And then a, the, 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 the public body could really go and say, well, that's the profits you made, and we're going to take these profits away from you. And then that it is connected to damages claims by saying that if later there are damages claims brought against you and you pay those claims, you will get back from our dis disgorgement proceedings what you paid in damages so that you don't pay twice. And um, interestingly enough, the law has just changed in Germany and there is even a presumption of a profit. Not a presumption of damages, but they presume a profit in the, the amount of 1%, um, which I find very interesting because that's just the other side of the coin. You know, if you overcharge people then you, and your profit is presumed to be 1%, you can very safely say that the damage on the other side will be 1% as well. And um, if, if, if that is presumed even in, in, in cases where there is just barely negligence, and just not a hardcore cartel. I would not be surprised if judges in Germany came to the conclusion, well, there's a presumption of 1% here, I've got a hardcore cartel there, and so I will estimate the damages to be 10% citing to the disgorgement provisions there. Um, there's also the possibility of the cartel office acting as amicus curia in, uh, in, in proceedings and um, I think they are very well suited to bring these kinds of uh, disgorgement claims and uh, because they have the information. They investigated the cartel. They, 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 they know much more um, than private claimants do. And so I think that would be, that would be a good idea to do that. But um, sometimes um, competition enforcers um, shy away from that, understandably, because that will tie up a lot of work uh, there because they, they, they don't maybe have the manpower to, to really do that in many cases unless they are given the, the funding to do that and sometimes states are not willing to give that funding if the money then goes to the injured parties and not to the, to the fisc. So I think it's, it's a very good point and one should think about that but I don't really see a great chance of, uh, of, of that happening in, uh, to a large extent. Thank you. Yeah, here we have like this very broad provision for class action type that, that the public prosecutors can actually lead those, right? So, and they're kind of substituting for the injured parties and then they can uh, uh, do that. Sometimes it's just too broad, right? I mean, that, that's, part, that's part of the discussion uh, uh, here. Any other questions, comments? 
Well, why do you think we, we still have a few minutes? We're running into 11 uh, uh, here. Just let me ask another question here, then, uh, Professor Kersing. One is that, as Anna mentioned, our law provided for uh, uh, a discussion in the pass on defense, saying that um, it cannot be presumed that there was pass on. And if a defendant argues uh, that the damage was passed on, it's the burden of proof of the defendants to show that it's passed on. But it says nothing about a plaintiff that is an indirect purchaser and is arguing actually that he suffered a damage because there was, the damage was passed on, right? Uh, uh, and so I'd like to ask you how is Europe dealing with that particular piece because we don't, that's currently a gap in our law. We don't deal with this uh, issue of the plaintiff claiming a pass on and that it, it, the plaintiff was injured. And now, according to our procedural rules, I think the burden of proof would be on the plaintiff to show that there was some pass on uh, damages here. Yes, um, pass on, very complicated. First of all, I think it's just a, a matter of normal procedural principle that if you argue something, you have to prove it. So it makes sense to me to say if the defendant wants to argue there has been a pass on and I don't need to pay, then the defendant needs to prove that. That seems to be quite logical uh, to me. As on the other hand, it is quite logical that if a plaintiff as an indirect purchaser says, I suffer damages, then you need to prove that. You need to prove that the direct purchaser suffered damage and that that damage was passed on to you. That seems to me to be quite logical as well, and that's the position of, uh, of European law too. However, European law has established a presumption of a pass-on. So uh, I think it's Article 14 of the directive that says um, that the uh, indirect purchaser is deemed to have proven that a pass-on occurred if, and I'm not just going to, I'm not going to quote all the requirements, but basically they have to show that they bought from a direct purchaser and that that direct purchaser has suffered damage but we know that because there is a presumption that cartels cause damage. So the direct purchaser has that presumption. That presumption can be invoked by the indirect purchaser. So the indirect purchaser has to show very little for a presumption to apply that a pass-on has occurred to the indirect purchaser. And I think that's quite interesting because the idea no overcompensation um, is there, but if you basically presume a pass-on to the indirect purchaser, well, then you have the direct one claiming damages, you have the indirect one claiming damages, and uh, you'll, we'll have to see how that um, really plays out. I don't think we have seen so many claims by indirect purchasers yet, because maybe they're reluctant to bring claims. And I should add one other piece of information, and that the question is, what does the presumption entail? Is it just a presumption that a pass-on has occurred? Or is it a presumption that the overcharge was passed on in full? And very interestingly, the law says, well, the presumption can be rebutted if you show that no full pass-on, that, that, that um, the overcharge was not passed on or not passed on entirely. And since the rebuttal informs you of what you have to rebut. You know, the, the rebuttal is basically you've got to show the negative of the presumption. And if you know what the negative is, you can deduce what the positive is. And so I think logically the law says we presume a full pass on to the indirect uh, purchaser. That's debated. It's not, been, um, uh, it's not been tested in court yet. But my argument would be we have a presumption of a full pass-on, and in order to be very honest with you, the German legislator, when transposing the directive, said it's not quantified. There is a pass-on, but we don't know how much. But I think that's wrong. Thank you. Any more comments or? Another question. Yes, please, Sandra. I'm not sure I need a mic. No, no, but it, we're recording, so you need a mic. You need to be part of our report. Thank you. So I think the question is uh, comments on like for from both the professor uh, Kirsten and also 
the other participants of the panel. So how do you see the role of uh, litigation finance in all this? Like we know that there are some courts in Europe that are more welcoming to this sorts of uh, lawsuits, like supported by uh, investors and so on. And like, how, so how do you see like the role of this in Europe? And how do the panelists see this uh, coming in Brazil, especially after the changes in our law? So we we'll welcome your comments. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Um, litigation financing, I think, is important and we should let it happen. I've seen quite a few cases in Germany where um, claims have been dismissed because um, the claimants try to bundle their claims and you know assign the claims to a special purpose vehicle which would bring the claims bundled and um, thus spread the costs. Um, so that uh, not the individual um, injured party would have to you know bear the very very large amounts necessary to bring these claims you know economic experts and and so on and then these claims have been dismissed by the courts arguing that um, the legal services act or something prohibited um, that because there was a conflict of interest between different uh, injured parties and so on and so forth um, but in the end, if you throw out the claims then, well, then you can't bring them again because they're time barred. The statute of limitation has expired and um, we just have to realize that you can only bring these claims if you let third parties fund that or at least if you allow for the bundling of claims and I think class actions are the way of doing that. Even then you might be some need some third party financing and uh, again we should not really strive for perfection here but for a decent way of compensating the victims who otherwise if you don't allow for that they will get nothing. And if you allow for that, well, they might not get the full amount. They might have to waive a conflict of interest here and there, but um, we, should, we should accept that. I'm not an expert in this field, but I know there are some uh, deliberations ongoing whether we should need uh, some legislative act regulating third-party funding. And um, I, I don't know at what stage that is, but there are discussions ongoing there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we should hear from our other panelists on this as well. I think this is a very important issue that it's also under discussion, especially with double damages, right? Whether we're going to have litigation finance on this uh, coming in very intensely in Brazil as well. So maybe we could go through a final round of, of comments and, and wrap this up. So maybe starting with Guilherme. Thank you. I think it's a, a good question, uh, Sandra. Uh, uh, I believe that uh, that may, uh, it, it may bring us to, to a good scenario where defendants can negotiate with only one part instead of uh, several uh, uh, claimants. As we see, it's, it's, it's a nightmare in Europe what's going on with the trucks uh, case, like uh, negotiating with... I remember I talked last month with, uh, with a Spanish lawyer and uh, uh, she told me that they have uh, like... Uh, per day, uh, 10 claims coming from different uh, provinces, uh, uh, different states, uh, different cities in, in Spain, like uh, all of them in, uh, 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 with jurisdiction on the case, so it's, it's a nightmare. So perhaps it's, uh, it's good to, to have a negotiation with uh, only one part and uh, more specialized, and, and um, I don't know. But I, I still think that it took, uh, we, would, we would not see uh, the results of uh, of that um, within the next uh, in the near future, uh, I believe, in more five or more years, perhaps. Do you really like the idea of uh, negotiating with just one party or an specialized? <laughs> really? I <laughs> I know <laughs> I, I disagree, but uh, no, just kidding here. But I, I think it's uh, in Brazil, as we mentioned, we are in the in the like in the first uh, era or first minutes of uh, private enforcement. So uh, uh, there is still a long way to go, and I think um, it's very hard for us to imagine, for example, the possibility, as you mentioned here, that uh, uh, to have uh, the binding effect. For example, we don't have binding effect in Brazil. So uh, in any way, we go to courts and we 
we start everything again. So remembering, for example, the generic drugs a case a case in Brazil that we had to, uh, that in the first minute the judge said, uh, no, there is no problem, there is no compensation here because there is no cartel. So after 10 years of investigation at CAD, the judge said there is no cartel, CAD is wrong. So and it was just for compensation. So we have had these problems in Brazil. So I, I, I think we, it's still a question that we, we, we can't answer. Uh, we have also this discussion of specialized courts in Brazil that I, I frankly speaking, I think uh, there are more problems than, in my opinion, more problems than uh, disadvantages than advantages because you have a biased judge that uh, the idea that we don't like. So definitely I think it's a very good question and uh, more to Europe and then we will watch and we we'll follow what you do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I agree with all you said. And I also think that in Brazil we'll face the same issues that we are, that you are facing in Europe with, well, there are a lot of items that have to be accomplished in order to actually get this damage paid. So first of all, so what were the actual damages in relation to these parties? Even if we have some presumption, how to calculate what is the amount that is proportionate to each infringer? Um, and I think, so what we are seeing in Europe, and I think we'll see in Brazil as well, is this uh, war of uh, legal opinions and economic opinions in order to uh, calculate all of that. Uh, there are, we, we did actually a webinar at IBRAC with uh, someone from CADE that uh, was uh, brought a lot of studies on presumptions of damages, for instance. So there are studies that calculated between, I think it was 10, 15 percent and 30 percent. So this could be actually one way to start the discussion. But yeah, I, this one I think in addition to all procedural and all the other problems we have, I think will, will be a big challenge here in Brazil. Yeah, I, I think we're, we have huge challenges ahead, uh, but I do think that we have a very, very powerful incentive. I mean, double damages. This is an amazingly power, powerful incentive to organize plaintiffs. So I wouldn't underestimate that. So either through uh, uh, um, litigation finance or through class actions of different kinds, I think this is really going to be a game changer on, on what's going on and how quickly I think we're going to see new lawsuits coming up. Um, it's, it's a new thing for Brazil uh, and even compared to other, to other uh, uh, areas of law. So let's see how it plays, but I think those that are, I mean, these are large lawsuits, and if you multiply damages by two, whatever the criteria you use for damages, these are going to be like multi-billion uh, uh, um, uh, lawsuits. So it's 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 going to be relevant to watch closely. But with that, I'll just give you the floor one more time, Professor Kirsten, thanking you for being here with us, for teaching the course on private enforcement of competition law to our students, and for participating in this panel. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for all your input. I even have a little list here of more things I could manage, like interests and uh, interest payments and so on. I will not do that, but uh, just thank you for that uh, really, really fascinating input. And I think I have learned a lot as well, and I'll take that home with me to think about. And um, thank you very much for having me here, and I'd uh, love to stay in contact. Thank you very much. Thanks.